It is our customary procedure to spend the next few moments in silent prayer, giving each of you the privacy of your priesthood to rebound if necessary. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity to assemble ourselves together for the purpose of learning the Word of God. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us concerning the things we know. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Turn in your Bibles to Galatians chapter 3 verse 5. Galatians 3 5. What we're dealing with here is the Apostle Paul and his four questions to the Galatians. And what we're really dealing with is uh, the spiritual life plus nothing, or the uh, spiritual life plus no works. Spirituality is the filling of the Holy Spirit. So the first question we had was related to the indwelling of the Spirit. Did you receive the indwelling of the Spirit by following the law or by believing in Christ? Answer, believing in Christ. Second question, did you receive the filling of the Spirit by the law or by faith? They received it by faith. And you remember that was simultaneous. You receive the indwelling and filling of the Spirit the moment you believe in Christ. Then you can lose the filling, but then you can recover it through rebound, 1 John 1, 9. The third question is, did you receive the sustaining ministry of the Holy Spirit through the law or through grace? The answer, grace. The sustaining ministry of God the Holy Spirit is the third question. Now we get to the fourth question. And the fourth question in Galatians 3, 5 is this. They are questioning the manifestation of the Spirit, and Paul is asking, are you questioning the manifestation of God the Holy Spirit? And God the Holy Spirit does have manifestation, as we will note. Galatians 3, 5. Does he that keeps on providing... Does he that keeps on providing, and it's keep on providing for a very important reason, and that is this means extreme generosity. It's actually referring to the fact that in Greece they had a public plays, and as in public plays it would be as if you paid tax money to have a play. That's what they did in Greece. And they would all take up their taxes, and part of their tax revenue would go toward a play. They still do this in Europe. We don't do it here in the United States. If somebody wants to have a play, they put it on privately and people pay for a ticket. They didn't have to pay for a ticket. They all paid for it, and then they would all go watch it. And, but the chorus era, the area of the chorus, they did not receive public funds. The government would not sponsor the chorus, yet there needed to be a chorus. So who would sponsor the chorus? A benefactor. And this is where we get the word, an actual benefactor providing. So what it is referring to, does he that keeps on providing, a benefactor, referring to extreme generosity, does he that keeps on providing the Spirit grac graciously and bountifully is how it should go. Does he that keeps on providing the Spirit graciously and bountifully to you, dative of advantage, he does it for your advantage, does he that keeps on providing the Spirit graciously and bountifully to you for your advantage and working with effectiveness, providing... Now, you probably have providing miracles. Well, that's an all right translation, but it, what it's referring to is providing abilities, powers, and strengths. And working with effectiveness, providing abilities, powers, strengths. The reason you have miracles is because it's referring to both natural and supernatural powers. And remember in the pre-canon era, they had uh, gifts of uh, healing, etc. But the filling of the Holy Spirit in itself is supernatural. It is not of the flesh, it's supernatural. Now, we, we can't go around and produce miracles, but we still have the supernatural feel it, filling of God the Holy Spirit. So it's referring to effectiveness, providing abilities, powers, and strengths. Inside, that is inside, by your doing the works of the law or by believing what you heard. Again, does he keep on providing? 
extreme generosity, the Spirit graciously and bountifully to you, and working with effectiveness, providing abilities, powers, and strengths, supernatural and natural, by your doing the works of the law or by believing what you heard? Answer, believing what you heard. That is where you received it. That is where you receive the manifestation of the Spirit by believing what you heard. And again, referring to believing, in this case, you are believing a gnosis converted into epinosis. Amen. Gnosis into epinosis. Now, what are the manifestations of God the Holy Spirit? We've went over this passage several times. Turn to Galatians 5.22. We'll go over it again when we get to Galatians 5.22. But Galatians 5.22 gives us an answer as to what are the manifestations of God the Holy Spirit. These are not the manifestations of the law. If you follow the law, you won't have one iota of these things. You won't even get close to these things. If you follow the law, what you'll be doing is shoving it down everyone's throat. And this is the exact opposite of the Holy Spirit. So Galatians 5.22. But in contrast, the fruit. Now the fruit is singular here. And it's singular because it's referring to the character of the humanity of Christ. And the only way to provide in yourself the characters of the humanity of Christ is to be filled with the Spirit. Jesus Christ was filled with the Spirit from birth. And, manifest, and the manifestations of the filling of the Holy Spirit were manifested in the hypostatic union. Now you must be filled with the Holy Spirit to manifest the thinking of Christ, etc. So what we have in Galatians 5.22, but in contrast, the fruit should be singular there, referring to the character of the humanity of Christ, which has its source in the Spirit. Of course, the character of the humanity of Christ has its source in the Spirit, the sustaining power of God the Holy Spirit. Then it goes on to list it. It is virtue love. Virtue love. We've noted for virtue love, the integrity envelope, personal love for God and impersonal love for all mankind. That is pr uh, produced by the filling of the Spirit. You can't produce that by the law. And in fact, the end of Galatians 5.22 will tell us that. It's virtue love. Inner mental happiness. The second thing, inner mental happiness. Inner mental happiness, of course, is plus eight, sharing the happiness of God. The only way to have inner mental happiness is to be filled with the Spirit. If you're sitting here and you're very bored, I don't mean tired, you can be tired, but if you're sitting here and you're bored, you're not filled with the Spirit. You can be asleep and filled with the Spirit. Poor Zach. What's wrong with you today, boy? <laughs> tired, huh? Daddy work you a lot? So we have virtue love and inner mental happiness, and that's plus H. Then we have soul tranquility and harmony. Soul tranquility and harmony. Go back to sleep, Zach. It's all right. Soul tranquility. If this is the only place you can get sleep, you can sleep. Soul tranquility and harmony. And that's another part of the filling of the Spirit. Patience. What's this patience referring to? Waiting on the lottery? No. Patience with... Patience with others. you got to have patience with others. That's the fruit of the Spirit. Patience with others. And what does patience with others mean? Stability of temper. Don't lose your temper. Integrity. Integrity. Generosity. Generosity based on grace, but the true generosity comes from the filling of the Spirit. Some people are generous when they're not filled with the Spirit. Some people just seem to have a, um, almost, a, that's part of their human good, almost. Well, if they're not filled with the Spirit, it is part of their human good. They just seem to be generous. But when you're filled with the Spirit, it does produce generosity based on grace. That means when you give, there's no strings attached. When you give, you don't expect anything in return. And in most churches, they don't give up based on generosity. They say, I give my 10% based on if I get blessed by God. And the pastor will tell them, you give 10% and you'll be blessed. Why, Malachi tells you so. 
But anyway, we've studied that. But it's generosity based on grace, not any strings attached, not looking for anything in return, not trying to manipulate somebody because you have given them something. Then we have doctrinal confidence. Elpis, confidence. That's part of the filling of the Spirit as well. Then in 523 we have even more. Humility. If you're not filled with the Spirit, you're not going to be humble. You're going to be arrogant. But if you're filled with the Spirit, it produces humility. And self-discipline. The last one is self-discipline. You have self-control, and it's, the meaning is quite the same. Self-discipline, in this case, the filling of the Holy Spirit produces self-discipline and learning the Word. If you're filled with the Spirit, you're going to want to learn the Word. It's going to produce in you a self-discipline to learn the Word. If you're lacking that self-discipline, check up on rebound. For example, if you've gone all day and say, hey, I don't really want to go to Bible class, i got something else to do, rebound. Rebound immediately because there's something askew. You're missing some self-discipline and the reason why you're not filled with the Spirit. And I guarantee you, as soon as you rebound and if you follow through with the filling of the Spirit, that is, isolate the sin and disregard it, the desire will be there. The desire is produced by the Spirit. Self-discipline. The desire for self-discipline in the Word is produced by the Spirit. Against such things there is no law. There you go. They're all trying to live by the law, but there is no law with the filling of the Spirit. I mean, what could the law say about that? You see, the law condemns. The law says, don't do this, don't do that, don't do the other. But we've done something against the law at some point. And so, as a result, the law condemns us. But if you're filled with the Spirit, there is no law. Against such things, there is no law. What, what does that mean? Well, if you have virtue law, if you have virtue love, problem solving device, number seven and number eight, personal love for God and impersonal love for all mankind, what kind of law comes down on that? None. There's no law against that. If you have inner mental happiness from the filling of the spirit, what kind of law comes down on that? None. No law against mental happiness. If you have soul tranquility harm, har, and harmony and if you have patience toward others and integrity and generosity and doctrinal confidence and humility and self-discipline, what kind of law comes down on that? None. It cannot. And we're not under the Mosaic law. We're under a higher law, the law of the power of the Spirit. So in this we must note the doctrine of the Holy Spirit's mentorship and this is what is important to us We've gone over it before, but it's important to go over it again as it is part of Galatians. And it, as it is part of the Apostle Paul making it very clear that it's not the law, it's the Spirit. Spirituality is not following the law, it's being filled with the Spirit. That's spirituality. It is not following the Ten Commandments. You're not spiritual because you don't mow your grass on Sunday. You're stupid, as Paul says, but you're not spiritual. You're not spiritual because you do this and that according to the law. You're not spiritual because you abstain from pork. You're not spiritual because you abstain from shrimp. You're not spiritual because you abstain from bacon. Yet, the law says you, the law says you should do those things, but we're not under the law. The Holy Spirit is our mentor and our teacher and the one who brings to our memory those things we have forgotten. So, what we will note now is the doctrine of the Holy Spirit's mentorship. Doctrine of the Holy Spirit's mentorship. Now the Greek word mentor was used in the 9th century B.C. And it was the name of a very loyal and trusted counselor of Ulysses. This is part of the Greek history of the word. Etymology is what it's called. Part of the etymology of mentor, it was used for a very loyal and trusted counselor of Ulysses. And he also became the tutor of Ulysses' son. Now in the English, mentor is used for a very close and trusted counselor, a guide, an advisor, and a teacher. If you're not doing well in a subject, you may get a mentor. You may get a counselor, a trusted counselor, somebody who knows the subject, a guide, or a teacher. We as believers in Christ 
because we are limited in our human ability, we have a mentor who teaches us spiritual phenomena. We wouldn't know it either of any other way except for the filling of the Spirit. You wouldn't understand spiritual phenomena apart from the filling of the Spirit. In our case, Mentor describes the ministry of God the Holy Spirit as a paraclete helper. And the paraclete helper means guide, teacher, counselor of every individual who's believed in Christ. And at the moment of salvation, we receive the mentorship of God the Holy Spirit. Now, our Lord prophesied the mentorship of God the Holy Spirit. And Jesus Christ was talking to his disciples and made a prophecy in John 14, 16 through 17. You don't have to turn there. I'll read it real quick. We've gone over this before. John 14, 16 through 17. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper. Jesus Christ had been their helper so far. And by the way, Jesus Christ in his humanity was unable to teach Peter. Jesus Christ in his humanity, even though the greatest teacher ever, was unable to teach Peter. And uh, Peter had a hard time with these doctrines. Why? He had no paraclete. He had no, as the uh, Greek comes out, parakletos, P A R A. K-L-E-T-O-S. So our Lord said, And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another parakletos, helper, that he may be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world is not able to receive, because they neither see him, nor do they know him. But you know him, because he lives with you, and will be in you. Now notice, the Holy Spirit lived with them in the hypostatic union, but now the Holy Spirit in this uh, post-canon era lives in us. He will be in you. The Holy Spirit indwells each one of us, and that's very important. And this is something the Galatians had learned. This is something Paul had taught the Galatians. He said, look, you're filled with the Spirit, and you're indwelled with the Spirit the moment you believe in Christ. And now you're gone in for the law and you think the law will make you spiritual? You're stupid is what he tells them. So because he lives with you, that describes the ministry of the Holy Spirit to the disciples in the dispensation of the hypostatic union prior to the church age. But now he will be in you, describes the ministry of the Holy Spirit to us, church age believers. And God the Holy Spirit is in us. And in fact, God the Holy Spirit indwells each and every one of us. And the Galatians understood that. You have to know about how far the Galatians went to be shocked by them. That's why Paul was shocked by them. Paul had stayed with them long enough and taught them enough doctrine that he had told them, look, you're indwelled by God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. You have the filling of the Spirit and spirituality is related to the filling of the Spirit. You know that. And he taught them that. But then, as soon as he left, legalism came along, and now they're trying to follow the law and the energy of the flesh. Imagine that. What's that mean? You uh, start missing out on doctrine, you'll go into legalism. That is, if that's your trend. Now, some people have another trend. They'll just go and raise hell and not care about the Mosaic Law. That would be me. (laughs) That's my trend. That's the way I'd go. I'd say, oh, I don't care. If I'm not going to live my spiritual life, well, I'm not even going to bother with the Mosaic Law because I know I can't keep the Mosaic Law. So, and he will be in you, describes the ministry of the Holy Spirit to church age believers. So the mentorship of the Holy Spirit is part of the three spiritual skills. I bring that back up so you don't forget. The three spiritual skills, filling of the Holy Spirit plus Operation Z plus the ten problem-solving devices. And they had been learning these things. The Galatians had been learning these things. Yet they went astray. As soon as Paul left, they went astray. And that's because a bunch of legalists came down and manipulated them into a system of works. And Paul had to come back and chew them out. So the second power option is what we note, the filling of God the Holy Spirit. Now we have the indwelling of the filling of the, the indwelling of the Spirit, and we also have the filling of the Spirit, and they are different. When we believe in Christ, we receive the indwelling of the Spirit and we receive the filling of the Spirit immediately. But it won't be long after you've been saved that you're going to commit your first sin. 
probably a couple seconds later to maybe an hour later. It's not going to take long. You're going to commit your first sin. Then you're not going to be filled with the Spirit. Then you're going to have to learn rebound. And that is, once you rebound, you will be filled with the Spirit once again, and then you can sustain the filling of the Spirit by being indwelled with, filled with the Spirit without sinning. So the Holy Spirit indwells the body of every believer. And the reason why the Holy Spirit indwells us is to give us some of the most fantastic blessings from our Lord Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit indwells the body of the believer to create a temple for the indwelling of Christ as a guarantee of our blessings. In us is the Shekinah glory. God the Holy Spirit indwells us to create a temple for Jesus Christ. We are walking Shekinah glories. And that is a phenomenal thing related to how we can have a wonderful spiritual life. The indwelling of the Spirit in the believer's body is found in these passages. I won't go over them, but I'll give them to you. The indwelling of God, the Holy Spirit, is found in these passages. And it is by faith alone in Christ alone. Romans 8.10 Galatians 2.20 Colossians 1.27 1 John 2.24 1 Corinthians 3.16, 1 Corinthians 6.19 through 20, and 2 Corinthians 6.16, Romans 8.10, Galatians 2.20, Colossians 1.27, 1 John 2.24, 1 Corinthians 3.16, 1 Corinthians 6.19 through 20, 2 Corinthians 6.16. Another reason for the indwelling of God the Holy Spirit in your body is to provide a permanent base for the availability of the power of God the Holy Spirit. That permanent base is in you. And you can have that power. The loser believer does not utilize the filling of the Spirit. Yet, you can be carnal, you're still indwelled with the Spirit. You always have the indwelling of the Spirit. You may believe in Christ, then you're indwelled and filled with the Spirit. And then you sin. Then you never learn rebound or you learn about it and reject it. And you never are filled with the Spirit, but you'll always have the indwelling of the Spirit. That means always available to you will be the power of the Spirit if you so choose to rebound. That means, you know what the indwelling of the Spirit means? It means all of us have equal privilege and equal opportunity to execute the unique spiritual life. That's what it means. We all have the indwelling. That means we all have equal privilege and equal opportunity. And you say, but nobody's ever really heard of this doctrine. They don't hear it because they don't want it. You see, when I go into prayer, I always pray at night before I uh, go to bed. If uh, someone needs the gospel, send them here. If someone wants doctrine, send them here. And believe me, God has the power to do that. Don't ever question the power of God in that way. And the fact that they're not sent here means there are very few people who care, number one, for the gospel, and number two, for the spiritual life. Mostly they don't care for the spiritual life since most people around here are saved. I'll acknowledge that, probably. Although if the rapture were to occur tonight, I think uh, some pastors would be standing up next Sunday pretty <laughs> shocked because, you know, they're still here. Somebody got it. But anyway, the fact is, there's just no interest, and if there were, well, God would open the floodgates. So as your mentor, the filling of the Holy Spirit provides the power for the spiritual life and the basis for teaching us the Word of God. God the Holy Spirit is our mentor and our teacher in the Word of God. John 14:26 says, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things, and he will cause you to remember all that I have said to you. So God the Holy Spirit, as our mentor, teaches us doctrine. And if you're interested in Bible doctrine, and if you are not interested in Bible doctrine, and you do not give it its rightful place as number one priority in your life, what you've done is rejected the power of the Spirit. If you say doctrine's not number one, something else is number one, I've got more important things to do, You've, re you've not rejected me, and you have rejected doctrine, and by doing so, you've rejected the filling of the Spirit. You've rejected your equal privilege and equal opportunity, 
and it will be known in heaven. Oh, we won't know it now, and it shouldn't be any of our business now, but in heaven it will be known to everybody. And Jesus Christ himself will evaluate you, and he will say to you, you had equal privilege and equal opportunity just like Paul. You had equal privilege and equal opportunity just like Colonel R.B. Thiem. You had equal privilege and equal opportunity because I gave you the indwelling of the Spirit. Now what would you do? That's what he's going to ask. And most people will say, well, I went for the law. I followed the law. And you know what Jesus Christ will say? You stupid Galatian, just as Paul did. Except he won't say Galatian. He'll say, you stupid, your name. And you stupid, your name will be ashamed. You say, Jesus won't say that. Yes, he will. In so many words by uh, depriving you of your rewards, that's exactly what he's saying to you. You messed up, you screwed up, and now you're going to know about it forever and eternity. Now, the fact that we have the indwelling gives us equal privilege and equal opportunity, and this is what Paul was bringing out to the Galatians. You have equal privilege and equal opportunity, and yet you're going in for the law. How stupid. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 2, 9 through 16. And we'll cut it short this evening by finishing with 1 Corinthians 2, 9 through 16. Dealing with the Holy Spirit and the importance of it. Then on Monday, back to Galatians and back to more chewing. Now he's going to lighten up a little bit in Galatians 3. But Galatians 4, man, Galatians 4 gets rough. Uh, very rough. It gets almost. Uh, it gets bad. I, I promise you. It gets. It, it get, You'll see. Galatians four. Paul. You think Paul's been tough now, calling him stupid and all. He's gonna. You'll think he's gone off his rocker. He hasn't. He's filled with the spirit. So First Corinthians two nine through sixteen. Two nine through sixteen. I push it on Paul now, so you don't get mad at me. First <laughs> Corinthians two nine through sixteen. But as it stands written, what the eye has not seen and ear has not heard, in fact, it has not entered into the heart of mankind what God has prepared for those who love him. It has, an, it, has it entered into your heart what God has prepared for you? Well, if you love him, it will, eventually. And what will enter into your heart? All of these doctrines. All of these, mirac they're out, they are quite miraculous, but you come by them from the filling of the Spirit. And you have the indwelling, now you can have the filling of the Spirit, and it doesn't enter into the heart of mankind, unless he's filled with the Spirit, what God has prepared. And it is phenomenal, absolutely phenomenal. It doesn't do, deal with money, although God will always give you what you need. But it doesn't deal with money, and it doesn't deal with success, approbation and all those things you associate with success it deals with a spiritual life and what happens is your whole priorities in life shift you see um, uh, God will grant you the desires of your heart when your desires line up with God's and when your desires line up with God's what will be your desire to have what is prepared for those who love him will be your desire and when you love God, what do you want? You want to be spiritually mature. You want to be in play Roma. You want to have all of these spiritual blessings. That's what you want. And all these other desires become secondary. As the song says, uh, that when you turn your eyes upon Jesus, all these things shall grow strangely dim. That is, all the things you think important now grow strangely dim. Especially when you're laying on a hospital bed, I'll tell you from experience, all the things of earth grow strangely dim. They have no meaning whatsoever. None. They don't mean a thing. So what? You've worked and you've got a house and you've got this and that and the other. When you're dying, it doesn't matter. So what? You can't take it with you. But what can you take with you? All these things that God has prepared for us, for those who love him. And how do you love him? Priority number one, Bible doctrine. But to us, for our benefit, God has revealed them through the agency of the Spirit. How are you ever going to know what God has for you? You've got to be filled with the Spirit. You've got to maintain the filling of the Spirit. Be sustained by the power of the Spirit. 
For the Spirit investigates all things, even the deep things. What are the deep things? Our portfolio of invisible assets that God has for us from God. For who among people understands the thoughts of mankind except the soul that is in him? Numa. Even so, the message from God no one has known except the Holy Spirit from God. But we have not received the human IQ of the world is actually what it's saying. We have not received the human IQ of the world. Human IQ can't understand these spiritual things. But the Spirit who is from God, that we might know the things which have been graciously given to us by God, if you're not filled with the Spirit, you're going to walk around ignorant and stupid like the Galatians and not know what God's given to you. You're sitting on trillions and trillions of dollars and don't even know what God's given to you. And what God has given to you is phenomenal, but it's something that God the Holy Spirit digs up. And if you're not filled with the Spirit, you'll never dig it up. Which things we also do communicate in words taught by human wisdom but in doctrines taught by the agency of the Spirit, interpreting spiritual doctrines to spiritual persons. What this means is don't cast your pearls before swine. Don't go up to an unbeliever and tell him about the angelic conflict. He can't understand the angelic conflict. Don't go up to an unbeliever and tell him about his portfolio of invincible assets. First of all, he doesn't have one. And secondly, he wouldn't know what you were talking about. Don't go up to an unbeliever and start talking to him about agape love. Only thing that will be revealed to an unbeliever is salvation by the Holy Spirit. And the only thing you have to do is say, believe in Christ and you'll be saved. And then after, if, he, if he believes in Christ, don't bother teaching him the whole realm of doctrine. It's too much to swallow in one sitting. Way too much. If he's interested, he'll get it gradually like we've all done it. And we all get it gradually. We can never get it in one sitting, never. So which things we uh, have been graciously given to you? Let's see here. Yes, continuing. But the soulish person, soulish means unbeliever. But the unbeliever, soulish because he doesn't have a human spirit. He has just a soul. Why does it say soulish? The unbeliever has a soul and a body. He does not have a soul, spirit, and body. When we believe in Christ, we receive a human spirit. That's what God the Holy Spirit teaches to our human spirit. So the soulish person is the unbeliever. But the unbeliever with a soul and a body does not receive the things from the Spirit of God. Don't try to give an unbeliever a bunch of doctrine. They can't understand it. Because to him it is senselessness. Or senseless. And it is. Furthermore, he is not able to understand it, referring to Bible doctrine and the spirit-filled life, because it is investigated in a manner caused by the filling of the spirit. But the spirit-filled believer investigates all things. That's pertaining to doctrine. It means you think doctrine, you're filled with the spirit, it applies doctrine to your life, you pull up a doctrine every time you got a problem. But he himself is investigated by no one. What does that mean? Privacy of the priesthood. He himself is not investigated by anyone. Privacy of the priesthood. So again, but he himself is investigated by no one. You see, you're filled with the Spirit. And if you're filled with the Spirit and you're doing your own thing, you don't deserve to be investigated by anyone. And if you're not filled with the Spirit... Well, you'll be punished and God investigates you, but you're not to be investigated by me or anyone else. And if somebody starts investigating you, especially if they're a member of this church or sitting in this church and they try to bring you down in some way, that is an infringement on privacy and not allowed whatsoever. For who knows the thinking of the Lord that he should instruct him? But we keep on having the thinking of Christ. And the only way to come to the thinking of Christ is with the filling of God the Holy Spirit. And that's what this nation needs today. Us stupid Americans need the filling of the Spirit. And if we don't, and if uh, believers don't turn around to this, and they are not, especially in this area, I don't know about others, haven't kept tabs on the rest of the country, but I can guarantee you it's not looking too good. It looks pretty shabby out there. A bunch of believers are acting like Galatians. 
They have the Spirit, the indwelling of the Spirit, but they're working on covenant theology. They're still trying to follow the law. They're still trying to act like Israelites, and they're not Israelites. They're royal family of God. They're trying to, um, it's sad, they're sitting on all of these phenomenal spiritual assets and are uh, just digging in the crapper, as it were, pulling up the Old Testament, the Old Testament. Pulling up covenant theology, that's crap compared to what we have. And even, now what we will get to, let's just move on just for a second. Turn to Galatians uh, uh, 3.6. Galatians 3.6. Now the law is from God, therefore the law is good since it was from God. And it was given to Israel. The law was given to Israel. But I want you to know something from Galatians 3, 6. Abraham didn't know what the Mosaic Law was. Abraham wasn't under the law. There had been no law. And uh, Abraham started out as a Gentile. And even before the law, what was the way of salvation? Galatians 3, 6. Just as Abraham believed, in the revealed God, now the definite article means it's referring to Jesus Christ. Just as Abraham believed in the Lord, that is the Lord Jesus Christ. And the reason why it comes out this way is because in the Old Testament they did not pronounce Yahweh or Jehovah. See, we don't even know how they pronounce God because they wouldn't say it. It was sacred. It's called the sacred tetragrammaton. And uh, we surmise that maybe it's Jehovah or maybe it's Yahweh, but we're not really clear on how they said Jesus Christ. Why not? Well, they didn't want to say the Lord's name in vain. So they never even said, they never ever, it wasn't even part of their vocabulary. They didn't even know how to pronounce it. They made sure they wouldn't say the Lord's name in vain. And so when people run around, Jesus Christ this, Jesus Christ that, there's no respect. Or when people walk around, oh, Lordy, Lordy, no respect for God, no respect for Jesus Christ. Or when they say, oh, God, no respect whatsoever. It might be part of habit, but it's something that needs to be broken and needs to be rebounded every time you do it. It's not. It's, so just as Abraham believed at one point in time in the revealed God, definite article referring to Jesus Christ, and it was credited at a point of time to him for righteousness. At the point of time of his faith alone in Christ alone, Abraham received righteousness. Therefore, he was saved. And Abraham didn't follow one tittle of the law. Didn't have it. So you explain to me and rationalize to me how you're going to be saved by the law when Abraham himself didn't even have the law. And yet he was saved the same way we all are. Faith alone in Christ alone. He looked forward to the cross, of course. We look back to the cross. And that's the only way of salvation, and it's not by the law. So you stupid Galatians and you stupid Americans, why do you think that way? You've been deceived by Satan himself. Satan has attacked this country in many ways. He's attacked marriage. First of all, he attacked us in the realm of dispensational theology. Our country swallowed up dispensational theology as soon as it came over from England. The British didn't like it too much, but we loved it. And we started out strong in doctrine. And the Baptists taught dispensational theology starting out. And they taught faith alone in Christ alone. And they may have even taught rebound on occasion. We've gone way away from that. And as a result, we're going to have some serious troubles. Not because of politics. It doesn't matter who wins in politics. They all have old sin natures. And they all get up there and the power goes straight to their head as soon as they get in Washington. I don't care if they start out sounding good and tough. As soon as they get to Washington, they are led astray immediately because they have old sin natures. They don't have any spiritual fortitude either. And so they just go astray. The only thing that will help this country is spirituality, not politics. Not politics. Politics will never save anything regarding this country. I don't care if the next election, it's 100% Republicans everywhere. It's not going to solve one thing or if it decides to go 100% Democrats everywhere, it's not going to solve a thing. We'll be in the same mess on November 8th and that we were on November 6th. And we're going to get in a deeper and deeper mess until people realize how stupid they are. 
And the only way people are ever going to realize how stupid they are is if somebody tells them. If Paul hadn't got up and looked at them and said, you stupid Galatians, they would have remained stupid. But Paul shocked them out of it, at least some of them. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity of studying these things. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us regarding the grace of God and regarding these things concerning our spiritual life. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen.